I just love the, like, I just love the, I just love the show. And of course, like, I guess you feel surprised. So welcome, welcome everybody. Um, 
hope you've had a, a great stimulating day so far. Uh, some wonderful talks and, and discussions happening over in the campus center this morning and, and this afternoon. And tomorrow uh, we continue uh, in Olin, right? Olin room 102. So tomorrow come back and we'll be continuing the conference in Olin 102. My name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and academic director here at the Con Aaron Center at Bard College, where I teach politics, philosophy, and human rights. And I am thrilled to welcome you uh, here uh, to this conference on judgment, pluralism, and democracy. Um, the conference uh, is really the brainchild of, of, of our Clemens von Klemper postdoctoral fellow this year and his partner. By his academic partner. Um, uh, Nick Dunn, uh, who's the Clemens von Klemperer Fellow, it's an annual fellowship we have in uh, honor of Clemens von Klemperer. And uh, he's been here for a year, and I'm thrilled he's going to join us again next year. And he's also a visiting assistant professor in philosophy and politics. And he, along with uh, Nirvana Tenut uh, from Dartmouth, who's an assistant professor of English literature and comparative literature, I really put this conference together and done a great job. So first of all, let's just all give them a, a really warm welcome. Um, as part of the conference, and, and really the first thing that, that Nick and Nirvana came up with was to uh, invite uh, a keynote speaker, and he'll introduce um, for later, but Lynn Shirley is someone who uh, has been here a number of times and is a great friend of the center and someone we, we love to hear, so you're in for a treat tonight. Um, I should say that this lecture is also co-sponsored with the De Gruyter Verlag, the De Gruyter Press in, in Germany. Um, it's the first of what we intend with them to be an annual lecture series, the De Gruyter von Aaron Center Lecture in uh, Political Thinking. And so I'm really thrilled to have that uh, partnership beginning. And this is a great and auspicious way to begin it. So for now, let me just introduce Nicholas Dunn and get you going for the evening. Thanks very much. Oh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the evening session of our conference, uh, Judgment, Pluralism, and Democracy on the Desirability of Speaking with Others. Uh, I'd, like I'd like to especially welcome everyone who's visiting. Uh, we're really delighted to have uh, over 25 speakers, um, people who've come from as close as Albany, but as far as um, Sweden and Sydney, Australia. Uh, participants from a range of disciplines, including not just uh, philosophy and political theory, uh, but communications, education, law, uh, and literature, uh, and uh, also we're delighted to have many uh, local and out-of-town visitors uh, here uh, in attendance. Uh, and of course, I want to welcome uh, the students, staff, faculty from our own Bard uh, community. So putting together an event uh, like this requires the efforts of uh, many people. So several thanks are owed before I get started. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues at the Center, uh, in particular Roger Berkowitz, uh, the founder and academic director, director of the center uh, for supporting my idea for this event uh, over the past year, um, along with Tina Stanton, who's the executive director, and Philip Lindsay, a uh, communications coordinator, uh, for their assistance in helping make this uh, event possible. Uh, I want to thank our two uh, diligent and enthusiastic student workers, uh, Julia Kiernan and Mo Zala, uh, and I want to acknowledge the programs in philosophy, uh, politics, German studies and human rights, all of whom are co-sponsors uh, to this event. A special thanks also to De Reuter Publishing, uh, who is generously sponsoring uh, tonight's lecture. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be able to announce uh, that in addition to serving, of course, as the keynote uh, uh, address for our conference, that this is, as Roger mentioned, the inaugural uh, De Reuter Art Center Lecture in Political Thinking. Uh, and I want to thank especially Serena Perota, who is the editorial uh, director for classics and philosophy at De Gruyter, uh, who uh, initiated this new partnership uh, between the Art Center and De Gruyter, uh, which will not just include this annual lecture series, but will also see the launch of a new book series devoted to the legacy and the thought of uh, Hannah Arendt. Finally, I want to thank my organizer, uh, Nirvana Tanuki from uh, Dartmouth College, uh, and I think fittingly, uh, I want to start by saying the idea for this conference, in fact, emerged out of 
um, conversation with another, um, though coming from very different disciplines, uh, myself from philosophy and political theory, uh, Nirvana from uh, the literary humanities, uh, and perhaps operating with different critical assumptions, uh, commitments, and priorities, uh, we nonetheless arrived at a common problematic uh, and at the idea of this conference uh, as a stage for generating uh, a conversation uh, about it. Uh, indeed, we see interdisciplinarity as uh, key to both the framing and the vision for uh, this conference. And what's more, I think we hope uh, in some small way that the convening of this conference uh, models a hopeful alternative to the forms of impasse uh, that we are here to diagnose. Uh, and herein lies the, the problematic. We're accustomed these days, of course, to talking about uh, a crisis of democratic culture. Uh, we need not look further than uh, intense polarization, deep disagreement, uh, and the more general breakdown of civil discourse. While we may not agree on anything uh, else at all, we can probably all agree that we've lost our ability to disagree with each other uh, in constructive uh, and meaningful ways. One of the latest responses to such realities is a focus on the issue of free speech. Uh, debates about cancel culture and uh, wokeness pervade our college campuses and social media. While some champion the idea of unrestricted freedom of speech, uh, others contend that certain restrictions must be put in place if we are to uh, realize other democratic ideals. Uh, but participants in both sides of this conversation seem more interested in the idea of free speech uh, than in its practice. What such a debate misses, we contend, uh, is a more fundamental question about the nature of speech itself. Namely, why is it important that we speak with others uh, at all? In other words, attending only to questions concerning uh, the content of speech, which is to say what or how much speech ought to be tolerated, is to miss the question of why, the desirability of talking with others in the first place. Uh, that this question is prior uh, is by no means taken for granted. Uh, as many would likely assert, uh, albeit unreflectively perhaps, speaking with others may be good, um, but it's ultimately optional. Uh, something that I might choose to do, uh, but nonetheless something that happens after I've made up my mind about things. Uh, after I've formed an opinion uh, about how things stand in the world or about how the world uh, should be. Yet in both Kant and Arendt, we find reasons to reject this way of thinking uh, about the relationship between thinking and communicating. Uh, in his 1785 essay, What is Orientation in Thought? Uh, Kant writes, it is said the freedom to speak or to write can be taken away from us by the powers that be, but the freedom to think cannot be taken away uh, from us through them at all. However, how much and how correctly would we think if we did not think in community with others to whom we communicate our thoughts and who communicate theirs to us. Hence, we may safely state that the external power which deprives man of the freedom to communicate his thoughts publicly also takes away his freedom to think. Or as he puts it more concisely uh, in his reflections on anthropology, company is indispensable for the thinker. In her lectures on Kant, delivered in the fall of 1970 at the New School for Social Research, Hannah Arendt draws out the implications of these ideas, highlighting the radical force uh, of Kant's claims. As Arendt puts it, the very faculty of thinking depends on its public use. In this, Arendt makes clear not only the connection between judging and communicability, but the fundamental importance of sociability to such a relation. Sociability, Arendt writes, concerns the fact that no man can live alone, that men are inter interdependent not merely in their needs and cares, but in their highest faculty, the human mind, which will not function outside of human society. It's this that motivates Arendt's turn to the third critique, and his Kant's account there of aesthetic judgment. For it's here that Kant puts forward the following maxim for thinking. Think in the position of everybody else. A maxim that for Arendt reveals judgment to be, quote, the most political of all men's mental capacities. The capacity to judge, she writes in her essay, The Crisis in Culture, is a specifically political ability in exactly the sense denoted by Kant, namely, the ability to see things not only from one's own point of view, but in the perspective of all those who happen to be present. 
what Kant calls the enlarged mentality and Arendt calls representative thinking requires what Linda Zerilli describes as the ability and willingness to imagine how the world looks to people whose standpoints one does not necessarily share. What makes judgment political, Zerilli reminds us, is not that it is about political things, but that it is arrived at politically, which is to say, by putting myself in the standpoint of others. It's not the object of judgment that makes it political, but rather its mode, a mode that stands between taking my own ways of thinking to be definitive on the one hand, and thinking that there is no definitive way to judge on the other. Such is the problem that a democratic theory of judgment, to borrow the title of her most recent book, sets out to address. A problem arising from a situation Habermas characterizes as an impenetrable pluralism of apparently ultimate value orientation, a clash of worldviews, and no shared conceptions of good. To this situation, Arndt says the following. The loss of standards, which does indeed define the modern world and its facticity, and cannot be reversed by any sort of return to the good old days, or by some arbitrary promulgation of new standards and values, is a catastrophe in the moral world only if one assumes that people are incapable of judging things per se, that their faculty of judgment is inadequate for making original judgments, and that the most we can demand of it is the correct application of familiar rules derived from already established standards. It's this passage from Arendt's Introduction into Politics that opens Zerilli's 2016 book, The Democratic Theory of Judgment. What would it mean, Zerilli asks, to foreground the capacity to judge critically and reflectively as a central feature of modern democratic citizenship? The answer is a sweeping study, expansive in its scope, dealing with the nature of rationality, language, truth, affect, and imagination, drawing on a range of thinkers, Hume and Kant, Wittgenstein and Cavell, Habermas and Rawls, Strauss and Gadamer, and of course, Hannah Arendt. For Arendt, Zerilli contends, the problem of judgment is not a problem of adjudication, that is, how to decide between competing uh, and conflicting opinions and values. Rather, it is a question of how to affirm human freedom. Judging, she says, must involve more than deciding questions of validity. It must be a democratic world-building practice, one rooted in the plurality of perspective that creates and sustains human freedom and the common space in which shared objects of judgment can appear in the first place. What worries aren't is not the absence of standards with which to decide between competing perspectives, but rather the destruction of the common world, the very space in which judgment can occur. Far from being something to transcend or overcome, the fact of human plurality is instead the source of judging politically. Without others, you could not judge at all. Linda Zerilli is the Charles E. Miriam Distinguished Professor of Political Science and the College at the University of Chicago, where she is also a Professor of Gender and Sexuality Studies in the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality, uh, for which she served as Faculty Director from 2010 to 2016. Uh, she is the author of three books, uh, soon to be four, I'm told, uh, Signifying Woman, Culture and Chaos in Rousseau, Burke, and Mill, Feminism in the Abyss of Freedom, and A Democratic Theory of Judgment. She's written numerous articles on issues in feminist thought, democratic theory, aesthetics, continental philosophy, uh, and the politics of language. Uh, Professor Zerilli has been a Fulbright Fellow, a Fellow of the Stanford Humanities Center, and twice a member of the Institute for Advanced Study uh, at Princeton University. Uh, in 2016, she won the University Faculty Award for Excellence in Graduate Student Teaching and Mentoring. I first encountered the work of Linda Zerilli as a graduate student, not long, in fact, after uh, discovering Arendt's lectures on Kant. Uh, while my immediate concern was to make some sense of Kant's third critique, something, believe it or not, I'm still doing, I became increasingly captivated by the political dimension, indeed the political potential uh, of judgment. I had the pleasure of meeting Linda uh, a year or two later at a conference on Arendt in Paderborn, um, hosted by Maria Robashkovich, who is also here with us today. Uh, and my work has, uh, since then, has benefited immensely by my continued engagement with uh, her and 
short work. Uh, Zerilli's work is not only timely, but it was not already clear uh, of crucial relevance to the theme of our conference, the desirability, and indeed the necessity of speaking uh, with others. Uh, her talk this evening is called Arendt and the Problem of Democratic Persuasion. Uh, please join me in welcoming Linda Zerilli. I want to thank Bard College and, of course, the Hannah Arendt Center and founder and academic director Roger Berkowitz and the Center's entire staff and all the students who also contributed to bringing the water bottles over to the rooms and doing that sort of thing and just helping out. Um, and special thanks, really, to Nick Dunn because he's done a fantastic job, I think, of putting together this conference. It's truly phenomenal. Um, and I also am really honored to give the first de Gruyter R and Center Lecture in Political Thinking, and I want to thank uh, de Gruyter Press for sponsoring this exciting new initiative. What is the problem of democratic persuasion today? The possibility of persuading someone who aligns differently from your political beliefs is becoming increasingly remote. Warring opinions appear to be irrationally entrenched, and when publicly voiced, frequently amount to little more than divisive partisan posturing. Indeed, we often seem to find ourselves in what Corey Brettschneider describes as the hateful society. This society has formerly legitimate laws, but a vast majority of its citizens reject the values on which these laws are based and cling tenaciously to their most anti-democratic beliefs. In When the, speak, the State Speak, What Should It Say?, Brett Schneider challenges the neutrality imperative that characterizes liberalism's ideal of a state society relation. Liberal democratic states, he argues, should attempt to transform citizens' inegalitarian beliefs when they oppose the core values of liberal democracy. The state should speak to hate groups and the larger society in value-laden terms. It should attempt to convince citizens to respect the core values of free and equal citizenship through what he calls democratic persuasion. Insofar as giving reasons is an alternative to state coercion, persuasion falls, argues Brett Schneider, within the liberal state's expressive function. Brett Schneider's democratic persuasion comments feminist legal theorist Robin West is unrealistic and a bit naive about the nature of hate speech. It neglects the vast terrain of hate speech not based on a well-formed ideology such as male supremacy or a uh, male, I'm sorry, male superiority or white supremacy with explicit beliefs that could be identified and potentially transformed, but of hate pure and simple. Furthermore, argues West, it's hard to even know how to respond to Brett Schneider's insistence that it is morally incumbent on people who hold these noxious views to respect liberal principles and that the state should be engaged in the project of exhorting them to do so. The people who engage in hateful speech and action also hate the liberal state, she argues, and not, are not available for such moral exhortation. The foundational incompatibility of values expressed by antagonists in current debates over free speech, abortion, affirmative action, gun control, or intelligent design creationism, she writes, reveals persuasion based on shared premises and sound logic to be illusory. Although I share West's skepticism, we should not exclude from the start the possibility of persuading someone to change her point of view. The question is not whether persuasion under challenging cases is possible, but how it might become possible. This possibility, I shall argue, involves a radical rethinking of what persuasion entails. Persuasion is typically understood as requiring an ideal argument that works from shared premises to alter beliefs. This argument might appeal not to truth, but to what is reasonable, as in Brett Schneider's political liberalism. It might assemble truth claims that can be openly debated and adjudicated according to argumentative norms as in Jürgen Habermas's deliberative democracy. The ideal argument is the picture, to speak with Wittgenstein, that holds us captive. Enthralled by the unadorned force of reason or reasonableness to expose 
those false beliefs, we miss the problem posed by what Robert Fogren calls deep disagreement, namely their immunity to fact, evidence, and logic, the very tools of rational argumentation. In Fogren's classic formulation, deep disagreements differ fundamentally from ordinary disputes. They are, quote, disagreements in which the very conditions for argument do not exist. The language of argument may persist, i.e., it may sound like an argument, but it becomes pointless since it makes an appeal to something that does not exist, a shared background of beliefs and preferences, which gives facts their meaning. A striking feature of deep disagreements is that they are, quote, immune to the appeal to facts not necessarily because antagonists do not believe what their interlocutor claims to be fact, but because the facts themselves are powerless to alter the opinion at stake in the disagreement. Parties may agree on various facts and disagree on the fundamental issue. In the abortion debate, for example, there may be an agreement between antagonists on both sides as to when a fetal heartbeat can be detected, brain development can be observed, and even on a broad moral principle such as the sanctity of human life. Nevertheless, the critical moral issue between them, the moral status of the fetus, cannot be settled by appeal to these facts or decided based on proof, where proof means the analysis of the meaning and implications of the relevant concept. Deep disagreements are distinguished by the absence of shared background commitments, a web of unquestioned and unarticulated beliefs that structure what counts as reason in any argument. The invisible framework of these commitments provides a fixed context in which of argument can occur, and differences of opinion can be clarified and resolved. Drawing on Wittgenstein, Fogren points to the idea of a Weltbild, a world picture, a systematic framework for making sense of and giving meaning to reality. A world picture is not acquired through reasoning processes. We adopt it by learning our mother tongue and being enculturated into a form of life through training and habits. Rather than being the product of evidence and facts, a world picture underwrites what we count as evidence and facts. As Wittgenstein remarks in Uncertainty, I did not get my picture of the world by satisfying myself of its correctness, nor do I have it because I am satisfied of its correctness. No, it is the inherited background against which I distinguish between true and false. Deep disagreement arises where two world pictures collide. Fogren calls attention to key par passages from uncertainty. Is it wrong, this is Wittgenstein, is it wrong for me to be guided in my actions by the propositions of physics? Am I to say I have no good ground for doing so? Isn't precisely this what we call a good ground? Suppose we meet people who do not regard that as a telling reason. Now, how do we imagine this? Instead of the physicists, they consult an oracle. And for that reason, we call them primitive. Is it wrong for us then to consult an oracle and be guided by it? If we call this wrong, aren't we using our language game as the base from which to combat theirs? And are we wrong or right to combat it? Of course, all sorts of slogans will be used to support our proceedings. Where two principles really do meet, which cannot be reconciled with one another, each man declares the other a fool or a heretic. I said I would combat the other man, but wouldn't I give him reasons? Certainly, but how far do they go? At the end of reasons comes persuasion. Think about what happens when missionaries convert natives. On the face of it, Wittgenstein's idea of persuasion looks nothing like the rational practice of democratic persuasion described by Bretschneider. Where reasons run out is where persuasion for Wittgenstein begins. At the end of reasons comes persuasion, he tells us. However, that sentence can be misleading when taken out of the larger context of Wittgenstein's thought. It can be, and has been, misunderstood as a leap into irrationality. Without reasons, we seek merely to persuade using rhetorical deception or, if necessary, force. In this view, persuasion is an inferior form of communication, it is what we're left with when reasons run out, our spade is turned, and this is what we do. Richard Rorty, for example, has made quite a lot of this idea of reasons running out with his notion of epistemological ethnocentrism, which I've discussed in previous work. 
and Foglin answering what rational procedures exist to resolve these disagreements takes Wittgenstein to say none. For Foglin and Rorty, deep disagreements are complex of world pictures intractable to rational resolution. Now, if we were honest, we would admit as much and embrace the non-rational technique of persuasion from the start. Our reluctance to do so, says Foglin, reflects worries about the loss of normativity and the demands on ourselves and the other that it entails. Whereas in the context of a normal argument, he says, people claim to be invoking mutually acceptable grounds and they can be held accept they can be held responsible for this claim. In deep disagreements, however, we give up all such hope and risk falling into irrationality. And so we live in denial of the limits of reason that characterize our most fundamental beliefs, our world picture, and we persist in the delusional assumption that earnest, clear thinking can resolve fundamental issues, concludes Fogelin. Does the idea that rational argumentation comes up against a hard kernel of deep disagreement rooted in different worldviews find unequivocal support in Wittgenstein? And is this a helpful way of thinking about how these disputes arise in the first place? The received reading distorts Wittgenstein's views and how reasons work. For example, it can lead us to think then when reasons are working correctly, when they have not yet run out, we would not need persuasion. It might lead us to believe that reason and rational speech are devoid of the doxastic and figurative elements that the Western philosophical tradition attributes to rhetorical speech and its corrupting epistemic tendency to create the illusion of truth. It might lead us to think that deep disagreements are of alt an altogether different order of language and logic than the ordinary disagreements in the political realm. The focus on deep disagreements as irrational and tractable to the political quest for agreement can lead us to misunderstand what ordinary political debate requires and how we might persuade other citizens on matters of common concern. In Arendt's considered view, to speak politically is always to persuade. Political speech is by its very nature persuasive. Does this mean that for Arendt, all political discourse happens at the end of reason, or that persuasion marks the move into rhetorical deception or force? Surely not. I shall argue that shared premises are for Arendt, as for Wittgenstein, less the necessary condition than the novel creation of persuasive speech. The ability to persuade is a quotidian skill in speaking to others that rests on the public practice of what Arendt calls learning to see politically. To see politically is to view the world from standpoints other than one's own. And it is accordingly to alter what Arendt following the Greeks calls the doke moi, the it seems or appears to me, whose formulation of speech is doxa or opinion. That the doke moi and with it doxa or opinion can be altered, as we shall see, shifts the question of how things first appear from a fully non-conceptual and unjudged phenomenal register, where how the world seems to each of us remains an intractable worldview, to a political and normative register where persuasion as art and understands it can occur. In her account, the democratic problem of persuasion is not foremost one of convincing argumentation. Indeed, skill in argumentation, she writes, is of secondary importance to the first successful creation by the polis of the political realm. I quote, the crucial factor is not that one could turn arguments around and stand propositions on their head, a skill in which the sophist excels but rather that one gains an ability to truly see topics from various sides, that is, politically, with the result that people understood how to assume the many possible perspectives provided by the real world from which one and the same topic can be regarded and in which each topic, despite its oneness, appears in a great diversity of views." Unquote. To see politically is not to strive for the God's eye view, the traditional ideal of objectivity that in Arendt's account runs the risk of losing our ties to the world. By contrast, she writes, the ability to say the same things from various standpoints stays in the human world. It is simply the exchange of the standpoint given to us by nature for that of someone else with whom we share the same world, resulting in a true freedom of movement in the mental world that parallels our freedom of movement in the physical one. 
Furthermore, the ability to argue and to persuade rests on this more fundamental discovery of the realm in which all things can be recognized in their many-sidedness. This is the political realm that first emerged in ancient Greece, or Arden. Quote, being able to persuade and influence others, which was how the citizens of the polis interacted politically, presumed a kind of freedom that was not irrevocably bound, either mentally or physically, to one's own standpoint of view. Put differently, one cannot begin to persuade democratically until one has learned to see politically, that is, from standpoints not one's own. And where disagreements about matters of common concern arise, one cannot persuade in the absence of the public space in which seeing politically is learned and practiced. The resistance of deep disagreements to the force of the better argument is significant for Arendt's account of political speech. It is a reminder that, especially in the registers of evaluative judgment in which they tend to arise, politics, morality, and aesthetics, the appeal to logic, evidence, and proof often fails us in the search for agreement. As Wittgenstein shows, a picture, rather than a reason, underwrites how the world first appears to us. This picture is not intractable to change, but open to persuasion. Persuasion seeks to alter the ungrounded picture that makes reasons meaningful. The difficulty is to realize the groundlessness of our believing. Wittgenstein speaks here of what we have difficulty doing, not what we must do to free ourselves of the pictures that hold us captive, as in realize the groundlessness of your believing. This is how Fulton misunderstands him. Rather than an imperative for delusional foundationalists, Wittgenstein's remark suggests that not that persuasion is possible because beliefs are merely contingent and groundless, which is more likely to incite skeptical despair than critical and curious questioning. To persuade would be instead to see that those beliefs, those stable, not up for grabs, may be unnecessary and could be open to change. We can form a different picture of things than how they might be otherwise. For Arendt to bypass the meaning-making pictures in which arguments for fellow citizens have their life is a failure to see politically. Though first discovered by the Greeks, writes Arendt, seeing politically was rediscovered by Kant, who called it the enlarged mentality, and explicitly defines it as the ability to think from the position of every other person. Kant invoked this ability as the basis for moving beyond impasses of rational argumentation in deep disagreements about judgments of taste. Quote, there can be no rule by which someone could be compelled to acknowledge that something is beautiful. No one can use reasons or principles to talk us into a judgment on whether some garment, house, or flower is beautiful, unquote. Although Kant agreed with the inherited view that one could not dispute, disputeion, taste using concepts or rules, he held one could certainly quarrel, stipend, about it, and rightly so. By contrast with the merely subjective judgments of the agreeable, I like canary wine, aesthetic judgments, this rose is beautiful, are normative. It would be ridiculous, quipped Kant, to say this rose is beautiful for me. For a judgment of beauty takes for granted that others too ought to agree. Yet we cannot compel such assent logically, which would involve cognition of the object through shared concepts or criteria of beauty. Just this absence of shared concepts led classic emotivists, such as Ayer and Stevenson, or value non-cognitivists, such as Hume, Mackey, and Blackburn, to declare all evaluative judgments, aesthetic, moral, and political, to be non-cognitive and non-rational. Wholly outside the realm of reason debate, they were at best the objects of the most deceptive form of persuasion or brute force. Their prejudices resurface in the idea of deep disagreement as beyond the reach of the rational, rooted in beliefs that we not only do not doubt, but cannot doubt, as they have no objective ground. For Kant, however, to leave matters there would be to concede that where disputing based on proofs fails, there can only be garrulous, idle talk. Kant thinks we can resolve quarrels rationally, only the grounds for doing so will have more to do with traditional rhetoric than with logic, appealing as they do to a shared sensibility. 
Notwithstanding his reputation as a critic of rhetoric, Kant sees that when we quarrel, we quarrel because it is rational to expect agreement in the way we sense, that is, how the object strikes us. As Joseph Tingley observes, Kant already recognizes in the first critique that there is a surplus of perceptual material that individuates any given object over and above the characteristics captured by its generic name, a determinant concept. Still, it is not until the critique of judgment that this insight is extensively thought through. What each holds the other responsible for in aesthetic experience is the mode of receptivity, receptivity within which the object appears. The general mental economy of frame of mind orients how the object happens to look, as to me. If one were to declare, that object doesn't look beautiful to me, it is not nonsensical in Kant's view to reply, then you're not looking at it in the right way. You're not seeing it as it is supposed to look. Getting you to look in the right way is the task of persuasion in the absence of shared criteria that Kant calls aesthetic quarreling. In Kant's view, the objective question of what one perceives cannot be considered independently of the subjective question of how one ought to be struck. That is, how one should take up or be oriented towards an object or scene. For Kant, the way the world seems to me is the kind of thing about which we can make claims on one another. It is normative and thus a legitimate topic for debate. We do not relinquish normativity when we quarrel without mutually acceptable ground, as Fogrin's idea of deep disagreement would have it. Instead, Kant insists that we can be responsible, we can be held responsible for how things appear, even without shared concepts for ordering experience and judging reflectively. And Hannah Arendt will agree. Arendt defends the value of Kantian quarreling in the absence of determinative concepts and standards of proof. For her, quarreling is the locution that best describes differences of opinion, disagreements, and the attempt to persuade others in the political realm. As Habermas sees it, political disagreement must remain interminable in Arendt's account, as it does in Kant's. Accordingly, she refuses to provide the truth criteria by which disagreements could be rationally adjudicated, just as Kant refused to provide standards in quarrels about beauty. But Habermas and like-minded critics are working with the binary concept of truth. Either a proposition corresponds to reality or it does not, that is foreign to Arendt's distinctly political idea of truth. She accepts the relevance of truth to politics, contrary to how she's typically read, but insists that the validity of any publicly relevant truth depends on opinion, with which the binary concept of truth is at odds. This is because opinion, whose original expression Arendt traced back to the Greek dope moi, it seems to me, is neither subjective nor arbitrary, but the basis for knowledge of the shared world and any rational debate about it. As Guido Niccolo Barbi argues, conceiving of truth as something needing support from opinion runs counter any conventional wisdom about the nature of truth itself, which is rooted in a binary understanding of truth from Plato onward. This binary concept conceives of truth as an expression of the thanatai, the it shows itself of the world in distinction to the doke moi, it sees or appears to me. That is, truth should only describe phenomena as such and should ignore any relation between phenomenon and observer. Truth should only describe what appears as it is, independently from its singular appearance in the doke moi, how it sees or appears to me. I have no say in how the world appears in its binary concept of truth. As Arendt writes in her Denktagebuch, Plato inserted an abyss between the thanatai and the doke moi, making the former a showing itself that was absolute, not partial. Politically, she writes, this turns the aspect under which something appears into something universally valid and absolutized. How things show themselves become how they are, about which there can be no debate. It is mad, not of plural aspects and opinions, but singular truth. Although modern philosophy departs from Plato in crucial ways, there is the idea that truth always refers to phenomena as they are, 
independently of Dodi Moore, that is, how they appear to any individual subject. In short, modern thought remains in the grip of the binary concept of truth and still the push on premise. In her think talk of this, Arendt explains, quote, the depth of modern philosophy arises when one becomes aware that the platonic logos is a tyrant who claims that the aspect already shows the phenomenon in its entirely, entirety. Since one lived in the illusion that the human senses could show more than aspects, one starts to distrust first sense perceptions and then reason. Modern relativism could be the redissolution of all universal unconditional truths into justified docci, aspects, if one had not already discredited these aspects once and for all. That's so that everybody believes whatever he thinks up, but not, of course, his aspect, which is objectively verifiable, is just as true as everything else. The discrediting of aspects is a refusal to see anything but subjective arbitrariness in the Dote Moi, such that even under the conditions of modern relativism, the aspect can never be world-giving. Plural aspects are equally illusory, save, of course, my aspect, which Arendt sarcastically notes is objectively verifiable, universally valid, absolute, and so a tyrant. Paradoxical though it sounds, in the binary conception of truth, that carries over to modern political and philosophical thought, plural aspects are discredited as defective truth statements, and their exchange is rendered pointless. Yet the absolute claim of the validity of the my aspect is haunted by the modern view of perspective based on the senses as irremediably distorted, which in turn motivates modern relativism. The consequence for politics is a curious mixture of dogmatism and skepticism, a rigid assertion of the rightness of my perspective, haunted by a deep, lingering doubt that human perspective can be world-giving at all. Against this platonic inheritance, which places truth outside the public sphere as a non-debatable fact, Arendt reminds us of the sophist recognition that there is always a pro and contra of any perspective, which is the original political philosophical discovery of the polis. Quote, Plurality is primarily the plurality of aspects. Each object has many sides, not just two. That is a logical distortion. To assert one's aspect is the ability to persuade. Therefore, Hato became an Athenian goddess with a temple. The corresponding art or skill, the art of convincingly presenting one's aspect, was the art of oratory. He made no point. This is the original connection between rhetoric and politics. Statesmanship is not the art of dominating, but of persuading. Such doxa shows here in its true form. It is not a non-binding of unfounded opinion. That's what Plato first made it out to be, but the expression of the doke moi. In contrast to Thanatai, only an aspect shows itself here, not the whole, but this appearance, this aspect is no mere appearance, shine. Arendt's thinking about aspects refuses at once the skeptical and dogmatic view. Both reduce aspects to mere appearance, and so perennial doubts about the possibility of human perspective ever yielding knowledge of the shared world. Arendt reclaims opinion by rooting it in appearance and putting the doke moi, how the world seems, into dialogue with how it looks to others through the practice of seeing politically. For her, the doke moi is not an untranscendable form of subjectivity that limits knowledge of the shared world, it's the political basis from which our sense of the shared world can arise at all. We have seen that under the spell of the thanatai and its binary concept of truth, the primary and immediate perception of the world is wholly independent of any singular appearance or standpoint on the world. Accordingly, in how something appears, I have no say. Arendt's view is radically different. For her, as for Kant, Objects in the world never appear in the abstract, but always to someone from a specific standpoint or perspective. Yet appearance in the doke moi is not merely subjective, but normative. I am not passive in how the world appears to me, but active in how I receive it. The world does not just appear in the doke moi. It appears to me. 
Arndt agrees with Kant that how it appears to me has as much to do with me as it does with the world. I'm at least partly responsible for how the world appears to me and can be held accountable in a disagreement that cannot be settled by appeal to shared criteria. The possibility of persuasion rests on the fact that every object is seen under an aspect and can, in the cases that concern the evaluative judgments of the political realm, be seen under a different aspect. If persuasion rests on bringing someone to see an object under another aspect, lighting it up so that it can be seen anew, how might that proceed? How does one alter the aspect under which to see an object without the already shared background commitment or web of unquestioned and unarticulated beliefs that make up the competing world pictures I described earlier. A critic might argue that Arendt takes these shared premises for granted and must take them for granted to get the game of persuasive political speech off the ground. This would mean, as Fogland's supposedly Wittgensteinian account of deep disagreements held, we can only persuade people who already share our world picture. Pushing back on that charge, I shall now draw on Wittgenstein to argue that persuasion, rooted in the Arendtian practice of seeing politically, creates, rather than takes for granted, shared premises when they are not already given in a particular worldview. It entails the capacity to bring someone who does not share my belief to change their opinion, with opinion understood as how the world appears and is first encountered or seen. But for persuasion to be world-giving, to generate our sense of a shared or common world in the political manner Arendt suggests, it must also be world-opening, not just to you, but to me. Persuasion based on seeing from other standpoints is more than the art of bringing others around to my view, as if that view were not at stake in change. Persuasion also alters how the world appears to me, the doke moi, and how I perceive the world, what is real, by changing how I receive it. Persuasion opens the possibility that I, too, might see differently. How might one light up an object that it appears differently under a different aspect, although the thing itself has not changed? Wittgenstein addresses this central question in his discussion of seeing aspects in part two, section 11 of Philosophical Investigations. Among the most striking examples of what he calls noticing an aspect and the dawning of an aspect are the figures of a double cross that we might see as a black figure on a white foreground, then as a white figure on a black foreground. Ground. The picture of the duck rabbit that appears now as a duck, now as a rabbit, and less striking but significant, seeing the likeness in two different faces. For example, seeing the father's face in the son. Characteristic of aspect seeing is our sense that something has changed, yet we know that no empirical change has occurred. As Stephen Mulhall observes, aspect change has an inherent paradoxicality. When I see the difference of aspects, writes Wittgenstein, I describe the alteration like a perception, quite as if the object had altered before my eyes. How then is such a change, such a paradox, to be explained? In Mohol's view, Wittgenstein's discussion of seeing an aspect is part of a broader critique of the metaphysical, philosophical tradition whose explanation for the paradox Wittgenstein shows to be empty but tenacious. Yet Wittgenstein's primary concern, he argues, is not with the unique experience of aspect change itself, but with the ordinary character of perception. We always see things under an aspect. No phenomenon shows itself as it is, independently of a singular point of view. On the one hand, this seems correct as far as it goes and aligns with Arendt's insistence on the irreducibility of the doke moi, that is, that we always see things under aspect and aspects are plural. But on the other hand, Mosehold's interpretation tends to rob aspect seeing of its potential for novelty, seeing things anew. Wittgenstein's discussion of aspects of Jack Abner Boss is not only about continuous aspect perception, how we usually see things, but also a discussion of how things can appear differently to us, how our routinized ways of seeing and meaning can be disrupted and how new concepts can be formed about changes in our experience of the world. The point of seeing aspects, he writes, lies in being the place 
where we expand our experience of the ordinary and the familiar without, as it were, turning our backs on it. The place where we strengthen our bonds with the world by renewing them and the place where we go beyond habitual ways and establish routines without giving up intelligibility. I argue that this potential for novelty, for seeing anew, is central to the experience of a shared world and crucial to democratic persuasion. Like Arendt, Wittgenstein discusses aspects in terms that run against the grain of the Western philosophical tradition. Neither objective nor subjective in the tradition's use of those terms, aspects, like beauty for Kant, point to something that I can try to get you to see because it is there, but not in the way you would not have to see it for yourself. We have objective criteria for establishing that something exists, even in your absence but aspects require your presence. I can undoubtedly say, I saw his face in the crowd. Assuming you find me trustworthy and the conditions such as such a sighting plausible, you would likely accept my statement as a perceptual report. But if I say, I saw his father's face in his own, you might believe that that is what I think I saw, but not necessarily what is there to be seen. To be persuaded of such resemblance, you'd have to see it for yourself. Just like you must see for yourself that the duck rabbit can now be a duck, now a rabbit, or for that matter, that the painting is not only hanging on the dining room wall, for which my word might suffice, but is beautiful. Persuasion is the practice of seeing aspects anew. It concerns not the existence of things, but your relationship to what you see, the part you play in what can so much as appear to you and attain reality in the shared world. In showing you the image of the duck rabbit, I'm not trying to teach you that there are rabbits and there are ducks. To recognize either would, of course, assume prior knowledge of what both are. But I'm trying to get you to see that what you took to be the one could also be seen as the other if viewed in a certain way. What dawns on you is less the rabbit or the duck than the fact that you could see something as elemental as a rabbit or a duck as something else. Hence the element of surprise. It's a duck. What dawns on you is not just the reality of another object, but your own ability to see differently. When we find ourselves in interminable disagreement, are we like those Wittgenstein describes as the aspect blind? The aspect blind, he explains, are not those who cannot see the facts of any given matter. For example, the double cross contains both a black and a white figure. Instead, they're blind to something else. The aspect blind man is not supposed to see the aspects, I quote. But he is also supposed not to recognize that the double cross contains both a black and a white cross. So if told, show me figures containing a black cross among these examples, will he be able to manage it? No, he should be able to do that, but he will not be supposed to say, now it's a black cross on a white ground. What the aspect blind are blind to then is not that there's a black cross and a white cross in the same figure. They are blind to aspects, that is, to their capacity to see differently, and its importance for being with others in the world. It is this that the aspect blind cannot see. To be aspect blind is to remain in the grip of the thanatai and the binary concept of truth. It is to insist that what one sees is all there is to see, the facts, and that one has no fundamental part in perception the mean to which something appears in the Doki Moi. The aspect blind may well see what we want them to see based on the evidence, the fact of the black and the white cross, but not see how seeing it, now as black and now as white, holds any consequence for their lives. As a result, they will never experience the change in aspect as a surprise, a new picture, a conversion, or a different system of reference with which to view the shared world. This may be why, in the abortion debate mentioned earlier, my opponent might agree on all the same facts regarding when a fetal heartbeat can be detected, brain development can be observed, etc., and still refuse to be persuaded that abortion should be legal. He accepts the facts, but sees no consequence for his position. It is not the evidence that he cannot see, but the change in perspective that could be his own. The aspect blind can neither persuade others when reasons run out nor be persuaded by them. For persuasion involves recognizing one's capacity to see anew. 
More than the ability to change someone's mind when reasons run out, persuasion entails recognizing one's capacity to be new. This capacity may be the real object of democratic persuasion. At stake is less my ability to bring you to accept my doxa or opinion by adopting my doke moi than getting me and you to recognize our capacity to see differently and to see the world as shared. Recognition of the shared world and the meaningful differences that can arise only on that basis is the real aim of Brett Schneider's value democracy. Unfortunately, his state-centered idea of democratic persuasion cannot quite arrive at the insight because it has lost track of the public political space common to all, the space where citizens assemble, the realm in which all things can be recognized in their mid decidedness, as Arendt described the space for seen politically. Consequently, democratic persuasion and Brett Schneider's political liberalism is limited to convincing based on opinions and reasons the free and equal standing of citizens already accepted. In what he called a hateful society, however, they're not accepted, but denied or refused. Could it be that the problem of democratic persuasion today, we have things backwards? We assume that citizens' irrational and dogmatic beliefs are the problem, rather than the absence of public spaces and regular space practices of speaking to others in which opinions could be formed through encounters with different beliefs. We start with the idea that beliefs are either responsive to reasons and shared premises, like Brett Schneider, or intractable, deep disagreements rooted in an interminable war of worldviews, like Fogel and Wittgenstein. We need to see instead that opinions can become intractable and persuasion impossible because they rarely encounter other ways of seeing the world in the public space. The hateful society arises where the space for exchanging views is radically attenuated, distorted, and non-existent. It is a problem to which the liberal idea of freedom of sovereignty and freedom from politics has made no small contribution. What exists instead are spaces in which like-minded citizens find their opinions, hateful or not, repeated and confirmed, not through engagement with contrary views, but through repetition. These echo chambers, where all voices are the same, reproduce a state of dogmatic solipsism, and facts use their evidentiary force to alter beliefs. Facts do not speak for themselves, but require a public frame of reference that makes them meaningful. Following Kant, Arendt argues that the very faculty of thinking depends on its public use. Without what he called the test of free and open examination, no thinking and no opinion formation are possible. Reason is not made to isolate itself, but to get into community with others. Critical thinking implies immutability." Quote. We should not underestimate what Arendt calls this factor of publicity for critical thought and the possibility of democratic persuasion. Without a robust public realm, opinions, hateful or not, are not formed, but merely expressed. The free expression of such opinions accords with the anemic liberal conception of freedom of speech that are in question. Quote, free speech has always come in many different forms and with many meanings. The key thing, however, is not that a person can say whatever he pleases or that each of us has an inherent right to express himself just as he is. The point is rather that no one can adequately grasp the objective world in its full reality all on his own because the world always shows and reveals itself to him from only one perspective, which corresponds to his standpoint on the world and is determined by it. If someone wants to see and experience the world as it really is, he can do so only by understanding it as something that is shared by many people, lies between them, separates them, showing itself differently to each and comprehensible only to the extent that many people can talk about it and exchange their opinions and perspectives with one another over against one another. Only in the freedom of speaking with one another does the world, as that about which we speak, emerge in its objectivity and visibility from all sides. If we want to alter how the world looks to some people, are and teaches, it's there in the freedom of speaking with one another that we must begin. Speaking to others in the public political space may seem woefully inadequate to the problem of a hateful society and the crisis of democratic persuasion. Taking up Arendt's wager, let us instead declare it is radical. If we fail to persuade, that is not because we lack shared ground, 
but a shared world. That common world can only be reconstructed through the practice that makes persuasion possible, seeing it politically. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I, I wanted to ask about the um, the norm, the, the normativity that structures the kind of judgments that are being made in these uh, open uh, kinds of discussions where we leave open the possibility that our views can change. And I just so just a kind of request for whether the Kantian demand is the right norm to think about that kind of judgment, or if it's something like the Cavellian invitation or something like that. Is it that you know, the demand kind of makes it seem like it's the kind of thing that is not going to be open in that kind of inclusive way where your own views are capable of change? And so is there a different way of thinking about that norm that's not the Kantian one that is behind the, the pic very nice picture that you're, that you're sketching? Thanks. Um, well, since you mentioned Cavell, um, you know, I, I actually use Cavell, Cavell's reading of Kant, because I mean, Kant, Cavell really does think that Kant's notion of anticipating, you know, the agreement of others, we can anticipate, but we can't, we can demand it, but we cannot, you know, secure it, right? I mean, there is nothing that I can, using criteria proof or whatever, secure your, or demand in that sense, your agreement. So for Cavell, I think it's very, actually very similar to what Kant is saying. It's just how you understand that demand. Of course, it's a kind of unfortunate formulation when you say, well, I demand you know, your assent. Um, yeah, you can demand it, but that doesn't mean you can actually you know, get it, and it doesn't mean that you can you know, in, in any way sort of bring someone to agree with you other than through this mode of persuasion. So it sounds as if, you know, you, all you can do here is really, you know, use the kind of criteria you could use with a determinative judgment, but of course, you cannot, according to Kant. So, I mean, I like Cavell's formulation better, I guess, but I think it still remains fundamentally a Kantian point about the normativity of these judgments, with which I agree, and I think Arendt agrees, you know. Um, so when you can say, you know, this war is wrong, this, et cetera, you make a public judgment, it's not just, I find it wrong for me. I mean, so there's an insistence that there's some kind of normativity in those evaluative judgments of politics that she wants to take from Kant, and so too does Cabell, although his focus is more on moral, you know, moral judgments. Um, thank you. I find your work phenomenally helpful, so thank you so much. Um, it seems that even though we have a shared understanding often of a key debate being between people who prioritize this kind of free exchange of ideas, the desire to inhabit other positions on one side, and on the other side, people who prioritize a specific vision of justice and would rather not engage in representative thinking. In fact, really, pretty much everybody across the spectrum agrees that there should be some kind of guardrails on with whom we're in exchange. We're not inviting in self-identified white supremacists to these conversations. And on the other hand, it seems as if everybody agrees that there should be some engagement with disagreement, some kind of inhabiting of the perspectives of the others. And so it, it seems as if often the key disagreement is in how to draw the boundaries of the community of acceptable disagreement, of whose perspective I'm going to seek to understand and whose I'm not. So what I'm wrestling with and I'm curious about is, for example, let's say there's a, a committed activist on the left who says, absolutely, I engage in political judgment and representative thinking. I am in constant conversation with people within the left who disagree with each other. But no, I have no obligation 
and there would be no good that would come from engagement with perspectives outside of the left. Is this representative thinking? Is there an obligation to think outside of that political community? And if so, why? Well, my answer to that would be no, it is not representative thinking. This is basically just thinking with people who already share your point of view. So I don't think it's representative thinking, but at the same time, I also don't think that there's any kind of, and I know you're not really calling for this, but I think sometimes one almost wants to call for it, uh, some kind of rule that we could apply, you know, and say, okay, these are the people we're gonna let in, these people. It's always gonna be context-based. You know, what are the contexts in which it really makes sense to bring in people who do not share the same point of view? That's not something I can answer in the abstract, but I think, Generally, if you're not thinking with people who really don't share your opinion, then you're not thinking representatively. You know? And it's, it's hard to think representatively, right? It's really, really hard. Um, because we all just think that you know, it's all about seeking agreement as quickly as possible. And you're not going to get agreement. But that's not, as you talked about today in your talk, I mean, that's not Arendt's point. She's not driven to achieve consensus. It's all about just talking to each other, speaking to each other, as you know, Nick titled this conference, and what's the value of that, right? So. Sure. Here, Roger. We had one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lena. Uh, I find it very instructive. Um, so if I understand you correctly, what the problem with this kind of political disagreement is not blindness to the facts, but blindness to our ability to see aspects of this world, uh, mm -hmm. to see from different points of views. Uh, so I wonder if it's right to understand you're suggesting that part of the problem is something like self-consciousness or self-awareness, sort of blindness to understand ourselves neither as merely passive, nor as merely active, but as receptive to current terms, as those who are actively responsible even for what they are receptive for, for their perception. And if that's true, I wonder how is it possible to cultivate this kind of self-awareness or self-consciousness? Mm -hmm. It's not clear to me exactly if it comes with this shared world that you also recommend as something we need to be aware of in order to approach this um, disagreement, um, this part of the self world. How can we, yeah, how can we gain this kind of self-consciousness if it is this kind of self-consciousness that we need in order to shift this? Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, I, when I was thinking about persuasion, so, you know, we, we typically think of it as sort of persuasion that means the, 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 the issue is trying to get you to adopt my views, for example. I'm trying to persuade you, right? And so we think in terms of convincing, and even if we think, all right, I might have to use rhetoric or something, you know, nevertheless, the goal is to bring you over to my view. And what I'm trying to open up here is this idea of persuasion. The goal is not to bring you over to my view by whatever means, be it a rhetorical or be it a, you know, rational, right, sort of language. Um, Cavell's got some very interesting things to say about this as well. But it's more about getting you to see your capacity to see otherwise, and also getting me to see my capacity to see otherwise, right? Because I can't bring you to even come close to my point of view unless I see how you see the world. That's, you know, that's the rhetorical tradition, right? I mean, who are you talking to? What's the context, et cetera? So I am just increasingly thinking about persuasion, persuasion as mostly having to do with this ability to recognize in ourselves and in other people. I mean, Rachel talked about this today in her own you know, her presentation, the ability to see otherwise. And this is where the binary concept of truth becomes so problematic, because within the binary concept of truth, it's not a matter of how you see. It just is, you know? And so I think that's why Arendt really attacked this. Um, I think that she, why she had that idea of opinion. 
because it's not just, you know, the world appears to me, like, as if it appears to me. In other words, the question of reception here is enormously important. And how I receive the world can change. And that's really what's at stake in persuasion. Thank you, Linda. And um, this was really wonderful. And when you said that we need that, that persuasion is not about based on shared premises, but about the novel creation of them, I think that's right on. And there's a, a quote of Arendt's that it reminds me of that it's never in any of her big published works, but a lot of her, her, her letters and, and, and stuff, where she says that speaking about piety and justice will make the world more pious, more just. Um, and that's her optimism that I see in your talk there as well. And so with that in mind, I want to come back to, to the question Rachel asked and your answer to it about, um, you know, is there, are there things, are there people off the table? Um, and, um, you know, there have been a lot of attempts to take people off the table, mm -hmm. deplatforming, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And at what level do we? And in thinking about this through our end, um, I've really come to focus on her distinction that she makes over and over again throughout her life in different ways between prejudice on the one hand and racism on the other. Mm -hmm. A distinction we really don't make anymore. Mm -hmm. we've, we've turned prejudice into racism. Mm -hmm. And she wants to say that prejudice, Jew hatred, just as an example, is not the same as anti-Semitism, a racism or an ideology. Um, and then anti-Semitism or racism is the end of humanity, but prejudice is deeply human, because prejudice is a broken one, as you put it. And so the hard part, I think, of what you're saying, and I, and I agree with it, but is, is thinking about the fact that we can't be anti-prejudice. Prejudice is actually the essence of politics, which is actually an argument she makes in the introduction of politics. And she says that politics she defines politics in that essay as the effort to dispel prejudices, but not get rid of prejudice. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you're really talking about mm -hmm. in a lot of your work. So first question is, do we make this distinction between prejudice and racism and exclude racism, but welcome prejudice? And then once we do that, we have to engage the, 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 what you're really asking us to do in this idea of the practice of seeing things in a new way is to challenge not only others but our own prejudices and welcome prejudice into the center of politics. Is that a language that makes sense to you? Well, it makes sense, but you know, it's one of those things, as you know, um, Introduction to Politics, which was originally published in German, Was ist Politik, uh, it, it, you know, Vorurteil, right? That's prejudice. But then when it gets translated into prejudice, you kind of lose the the wordplay that's going on in that text, i.e., exactly. And so, I mean, so much in about prejudice for Arndt, you're absolutely right. She says we cannot possibly get rid of all prejudices. We would require a superhuman alertness, I believe is her phrase, right? Uh, and that's, you know, Wittgenstein's point about the world picture, all these things. I mean, what we do not doubt, okay, that makes it possible to doubt. But that doesn't mean that what I now do not doubt cannot be someday formulated as an empirical proposition, which can be doubted. It's just to say that the skeptic's wrong and you cannot doubt everything at once. So the idea that we could dispel all prejudices at once, you know, that all those things, that the ungrounded ground on which the things that we think, like racism, right, that have their sort of basis, if I can use that language, um, is, you know, that's impossible. However, I think it's important to see, as you well know, Roger, you know, Arendt's idea with prejudices is that there's an ortheil, there's a judgment in every prejudice, actually. It's not so much, I, but although maybe you can explain to me what you meant there, it's not so much the doke moi, you know, although the doke moi, I think, is normative, as I was saying earlier, but there's a, an ortheil of, of judgment that we've lost track of, we've forgotten. And that's why thinking is really that thing of getting at this original judgment that's there, that lurks there. And we're unaware that we have ever even made it, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but in a way we're kind of making it each time we reassert the prejudice, unaware that we're judging it all, 
you know, it's a kind of naturalization of a judgment that once took place that we just need to go. So, yeah. <laughs> On. Um, thank you so much for your talk, and I think you've spoken to elements of my question and the answers, but I'm not quick enough to totally reframe my question, so I'm just going to go ahead with it. Um, and it's it's about I mean I still I still have this question, so I'm wondering if I could I I, I really appreciated how you articulated the benefit of um, looking to and obviously Arendt does this through through Kant, as many others do, looking to aesthetic judgments as a kind of analogy for something other than the binary approach to truth. Um, but I'm wondering if, if aesthetic judgments and the analogy of, you know, the rose is beautiful, or maybe the duck is actually a rabbit, gets us far enough in thinking about the nature of political judgment. Um, and so, and, and, and maybe there are just multiple Parts of political judgment, and, and you said you're not necessarily talking about consensus-driven um, political judgment, but I'm thinking of this phrase, doke moe, and I have not read all rent. Um, but doke moe comes up a lot in platonic dialogues where individuals are asked, you know, what is justice? How does that appear to you? And I can see how that really sort of, you know, um, intersects with this idea of like, how does the rose appear to you? Is it beautiful? Let me see it from your perspective. But another place, and maybe Arendt talks about this, maybe she doesn't, that's part of my question to you, is that, that it comes up in Athenian politics, is when a decision was made in the assembly, and the way that it was announced was, it appears to the demos, doke. So it's still that appearance, but it's collective. Um, and so just shifting over to that political study of judgment and decision making, which of course is oriented around political action and decision making and consensus, the question is not, um, it, it doesn't seem to me to map onto a kind of aesthetic question or an appearance or aspect question. It's a question about what are we going to do, which is which uh, assumes a question, what is our collective sense of good and who are we? And those are very different questions than how does something appear to us. I mean, of course, you know, they're probably incorporated or inter interrelated, but that that other kind of question, this decision about collective action and the common good, who we are mm -hmm. as a political community, um, is also, and, and then making that it appears to the demos claim is a political act of power, an assertion of power. And I'm just wondering if the thinking about judgment and political judgment in the realm of aesthetics really gets us into that terrain as much as we need to be if we're really thinking about political decision making and judgments and working with others as fellow citizens. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, well, I don't speak Greek, <laughs> you know, so I can't, I mean, I, I, I take it that you do, and I I don't know, you know, exactly how you're, what you're thinking about there. Um, let me let me just say, I, for, for Arendt, I mean, she's got this very interesting discussion of what is the relationship of judgment to action? Right, because you're setting, making that distinction there, and and she says, you know, judgment doesn't set out; it doesn't tell me how to act, right? And that's always been bothersome to a lot of people because it get this, we get this sense of, well, then what's judgment good for, right? I mean, why judge if it's not going to tell you how to act? But she's very insistent upon that, and I think that's an interesting. That's interesting that she wants to insist upon that. Um, and, and secondly, when I say, you know, there's a lot of debate, a lot of debate about Arendt's uh, appropriation of Kant's third critique and the idea of, you know, the aestheticization of politics and all this other horrible stuff. And I'm really not so focused on, you know, so focused on the question of aesthetics as such. I'm focused on the question of evaluative judgments. Okay, so evaluative judgments. Which for which we don't have these criteria, you know, shared criteria of proof. Um, that's where I think that's what she's really trying to draw out of Kant. So it has less to do with aesthetics as such. It has more to do with how to make a judgment in the absence of a, you know, a concept, basically. And that can apply to lots of different uh, judgments. 
um, I don't know if that gets it exactly what you what's bothering you. So respond if you. Well, like. I no, I mean, I. It seems to me like I'm totally persuaded, and I thought your rearticulation of this point, both you know, both in the talk and the Q and A, was really powerful. That like that that you're not thinking necessarily about this consensus driven. Um, political deliberation, but you're in fact thinking about something that maybe is prior, that we need to have spaces within which we cultivate the capacity and the self-knowledge of thinking otherwise and mm -hmm. seeing things from different aspects. So, mm -hmm. so maybe that's just a different part of politics that we need and that supports this other thing. But you opened the talk with discussing something that we're all concerned about, which is this like intractable polarization in mm -hmm. politics. And a lot of that has to do with making decisions together about what we're going to do mm -hmm. um, and how we're going to act and who we are as a political community. And those decisions and the judgments, the practices of judgments that that, that entails are, are so, you know, are, are practices of power. And I guess I'm, I'm just wondering how power can kind of fit in to the model of judgment that takes as its sort of uh, inspiration, perspectives of like the duck and, mm -hmm. you know, the duck and what's it, the rabbit, the rabbit and the duck, or is the rose beautiful? Like those aren't about power, those are about mm -hmm. seeing, but it doesn't really get us to positionality in these ways. Or yeah. it does get us to positionality, but it, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, my talk was not about power as such. And I think that Arne's um, work is not about power as such, you know, that's not really the focus. Her mm -hmm. focus is, you know, freedom. I mean, politics is about freedom. That's the raison d'etre of politics for Arndt. So there are lots of people who disagree with her on this, and I can understand the reasons. Uh, there's a, I think here, you know, what's playing kind of the role of power is the idea of, you know, in these deep disagreements, what Robert Hoagland called these deep disagreements, there is then a, you know, we resort to rhetoric or force, mm -hmm. right? So that power comes in precisely when we reach that point where we cannot persuade anyone on the basis of shared premises, you know? And I mean, it's, it's also an interesting discussion. I don't wanna go off on a tangent here, so I'll try to be very quick. But there's an interesting discussion here, maybe getting back to the Cavell thing, about, you know, the use of reason and rationality and the extent to which rationality it can be seen as a form of power and force, you know, or the extent to which it can be seen as a form of persuasion in the way that Arndt wants to talk about it. And, you know, one of the distinctions that Cavell makes in his work, and here's where he draws on Kant, is that we normally think about rationality as agreement, you know, agreement in premises sort of leads to agreement in conclusions. If you agree on the premises, you've got to agree on the conclusions. That's kind of like that murderous <coughs> alphabet, sort of almost that R and talks about in origins, right? I mean, if you say it's A, then it's like, you know, all the way down. And what Cavell brings out is that it's not that we're not using rationality, but it's rationality of a different form. So it's rationality as patterns of speaking. You know, I, I don't recognize you as being in an aesthetic argument with me if you don't speak in a certain way. It's not so much that you're using, you're assuming shared premises to reach a forth a conclusion, almost, but rather that you speak in a certain way. So it's those patterns of speaking that we think someone is actually having an aesthetic quarrel with me, or is not. Um, that's probably the best I could do. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. and. Uh, I'm not a political theorist, so I won't cite anyone. Hi, I'm right Oh, here. I'm sorry. Are you again? But I'm really interested in this phrase, Don Kemoy, and uh, appears to me, and I guess the directional reference uh, in that phrase, because I think that, like the to me, because mm -hmm. I think that many people experience that to me as assaultive, mm -hmm. uh, have things in the world that experience of um, the assault of other ideas, or the world is sort of constitutive of their ideology and their sense of self. Uh, so there's a recent headline that I saw that said, uh, my left-wing university is forcing moderate students to the right. Uh, and I think the kind of relational dynamic that headline refers to is nonpartisan, so it's just a general thing. So if having any point of view can always feel like being at war, 
I wonder if persuasion isn't about seeing from the standpoint of others, but making another feel joined in their kind of anxious attachment to a self, or imagined that I'm on their side in that ongoing assault with the world. Um, and so is this about seeing, or is this about method acting? Like where I operate from the perspective of the character holding on to what I really believe. Um, so yeah, is it about thinking and judgment or performance? So you're saying that there's, you know, it's this question of whether this is really about persuasion or it's just a performance? Let me just understand that last line. Yeah, like, the, um, like my students, for example, uh -huh. uh, who say lots of things that I don't agree with, uh, and they can feel intractable, but less so once they feel joined in their generational fight with climate change or against finance capital or uh, upwards mobility, once they feel joined in those anxieties, by me, they're much more willing to hear critique or criticism would be persuaded. So uh, I don't know if I necessarily see the world from their, or the aspects of things as they might see it, but they feel joined in their uh, sense of being assaulted by X or Y thing. And mm. this is what Trump did, right? Like Trump makes uh, working class white people feel like he's in their fight against whatever it might be, you know, my, uh, migrants, black people, uh, queers. <laughs> so, is it a question of seeing from or performing with? I see. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I would have wanted to use Trump as a candidate here for sure. ranking. Um, you know, but I, but I don't. No, I think it's. I see. I see what you mean. I think about how someone. If they think I, but then that's a question of they already think I share their perspective. I think Arendt's point is not about seeing from the perspective of others. is isn't about adopting their perspective, right? This is why she calls it, I didn't go into this in my talk, but you know, representative thinking. So it's not, it's not about you know, becoming the other person, getting in their skin, so to speak, being in that place. It's, really much more of a kind of imaginative visiting, but I always remain myself, so to speak. So she's very careful, one, as most of you, most of you read a lot of Arendt, so you'll know, she's always, this is not an enlarged empathy, right? And it's not about just becoming the other person. So it really isn't a politics of recognition in that sense. It's radically different from that. And that's the thing about Arendt is always, she's always coming back to this thing of, you know, it's I have to judge, right? I have to, but I owe it not, not it's not just to other people, it's to the world, right? Because the world is really the thing that, in her view, brings us together. That's what we have in common, not this perspective now that, you know, I now move to your perspective and I have that in common with you. It's more like now I can see the world more objectively. I mean, she has this perspectival understanding of objectivity. So, you know, you see this room differently than I see the room from this perspective, you know, and if we were to go around, we would all see the room, you know, hopefully more completely if we were to occupy every chair in this room. So it's that sort of view, but, you know. Um, thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, I find the like language of aspect and the examples very helpful in one way to sort of getting getting this in view. Yeah. Um, but I also wonder kind of how the analogy might start to break down once we move to the evaluative and the normative realm. So you know when I'm uh, showing the you know stuffed rabbit to a friend, I say rabbit, and you know it kind of springs to mind um, that uh, you know it's a, a rabbit. They, you know, um, and I like that's kind of all I have to say. You know, um, with something beauty, you know, I might kind of. Photographing is another great example of like where you know you might 
when in photographing things, we kind of present them in a in a certain way, and then people can see the scene or the you know the beauty in a scene um, that they might not otherwise see. Um, but just what does that look like? You know, so so I mean, the case of um, the abuse of migrants or police brutality or domestic violence. I mean, how how do I get someone to see those things from a different aspect. I can't just say, you know, wrong, like I say duck, um, to, to make the flip happen. So I, I guess I just want to invite you to like flesh that out just a little bit more, es especially when people are maybe resistant to seeing from the perspective of the other, and so resistant to perhaps the kind of persuasion that uh, you're imagining. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I also think that, uh, and I, you know, I probably shouldn't even use that now, um, you know, the duck rabbit, because the duck rabbit, forget the duck rabbit, the duck <laughs> rabbit isn't even, isn't even really the point in these passages from Wittgenstein, so just go read them for yourself, you know, because there's, there's so much going on in there about um, aspect scene. I was just trying to bring it in because Arendt is very focused on this concept of aspect. And it really just kind of triggered something in my mind, because I know of Wittgenstein, you know, that it's like she really is talking about seeing aspects and the awareness that you can see aspects and that aspects are like evaluative judgments, you know. They are neither objective nor subjective in the traditional philosophical sense of the term. And so the ability to see aspects is both at once to see something that really is there. I mean, this is the claim made by, you know, some dope or whatever, but you know, folks like John McDowell, et cetera. I mean, that there's, you know, there really is something there. Like, it's not as if it's all just in my head. Uh, but at the same time, to see it, I have to see it. You can't just tell me it's there. That was the difference I was trying to make between, you know, I could tell you there's a painting in the other room, you could just take it for granted. Okay, she sounds crazy, she knows what painting looks like. But if I tell you it's beautiful, that's something you have to go and do for yourself. So the fact that each of us has to actually participate in this, aspect seeing is something that I have to do for myself. You know, I can't tell you, forget the talk, but whatever it is. Uh, see, however, it's if you read these passages of Wittgenstein, you know, a lot of it is about just bringing someone like, you know, he's got these sections where he talks about if you want to get somebody to see, you know, what Brahms's music is like, and you just keep showing them all these different pieces of Brahms music, right? Until, and then eventually, maybe they'll see it. But there isn't, you know, I wish there were sometimes, but there isn't any, like, I don't know, rule or, or even just strategy. It's more about this insistence that, you know, you're not seeing it Right, <laughs> you know, like that I continue to insist that there's another way to see it. And you may see it the way I see it, but you may also not. Um, because it just depends on you in the end. And persuasion can never be, in that sense, it's kind of like what Kant's saying about aesthetic judgments. I mean, I can anticipate your agreement, but I cannot compel it. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so thank you so much for this talk. Um, I wanted to ask if you think there's a problem of the agreement. <laughs> um, so the way I'm thinking about that is um, agreement? deep agreement. Okay, sure. And, and not just in the sense that the people who are disagreeing agree with yeah. themselves while they disagree with, but um, to give you an idea of what I have in mind. Um, so for like the past half decade, I've been in one of my classes, I teach a unit on prison abolitionism. and Five, six years ago, everyone would just dismiss the Angela Davis book reading like right out of hand. They would just refuse to even think of it as a possibility. Um, and now when I teach it, <laughs> everyone's automatically persuaded. Um, and of course, we're in a different political moment now. Um, I don't think this, they've been persuaded because of representative thinking or anything. I think, I think it's just in the air. Um, but in a way, it's too easy for them now, and they're still not really entering into the, into the book and letting it really challenge them. Um, and so, and they're certainly not being like drawn to abolitionist practice for most part of them. Um, so, and the question is not just how do we motivate people to act, but I want to say just that there's a kind of deep agreement on both sides that like this is like that kind of cynicism, like it's not going to change. Um, and I think there's a lesson there for about 
the general political discourse in America where we're, people are agreeing on a lot, <laughs> uh, whether it's climate change or not, even if they're <coughs> changing what they say, um, the way that they live with that belief, they haven't been persuaded into living with that belief in a different way. Um, <coughs> yeah, I don't, I don't have any thoughts Oh, yeah, that. yeah. I mean, I, I, absolutely. I, I, that is a, that's, a, that's a great point. You know, when you think about it in terms of just disagreement, but just agreement, right? Because, um, but I guess I just want to say what you just described, that's, that's not agreement in the sense that, you know, it's not really, it's more like a, you know, a prejudice or something. I mean, it's something, you haven't even subjected it to any kind of critical thinking. You haven't done any representative thinking. You haven't thought from the standpoint of other people. I mean, it's just something that everyone says and everyone already knows, you know? I mean, that kind of, um, you know, what is just taken for granted at this point, whatever your group is, mm -hmm. okay? But of course, this isn't exactly new, it's just the things we agree on have changed. But the problem of deep agreement existed back then when nobody wanted to read Angela, you know, you're telling your class wanted to read Angela Davis, right? So it's, it's a similar kind of problem. Um, so, but I think it's similar to this issue of deep disagreement in that what's lacking is precisely this willingness or ability to think about it from, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like what Arne says about opinion formation, right? This is her whole argument against, or part of her argument against um, liberal conceptions of, of free speech is just that you're expressing opinions, but you're not forming opinions. So the idea of opinion formation is like you know coming to an agreement on something has to do with actually first of all entertaining the possibility that there could be another way of thinking about it that is not just insane. So, you know. Hi. Um, oh, sorry. Oh my God. Hi. Um, sorry. I'm like the disembodied voice. In here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm Antonia. I'm a student at Howard College. I study yeah. philosophy and dance. And, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm coming with the perspective that art, um, in addition to being this sort of combination of aesthetics, um, is implicitly at least a, a tool of, of, of politics, a, a mechanism um, of politics. And so I'm wondering, um, for you, what place does the abstract, such as metaphor, extended metaphor, art, image making, um, the theater have in persuasion? Um, and the abstract function as a mechanism of persuasion to more easily reveal or change our way of seeing um, in comparison to more traditional methods of speech um, that are utilized. Short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, and you know, I didn't, I wasn't able to get into this here because I, whatever talk would have gotten even longer than it was. But the. It's connected up with also with the tradition of rhetoric, right? That is to say that when I was talking about the idea of a picture, right, and talking about the sort of figurative basis, metaphorical basis of rational speech. I mean, this is something that I take a lot from Ernesto Grassi, who's written quite a bit about this, that the bottom of all rational speech is is a figure, right? Is a rhetorical speech. And that's you know, figure, I mean, the figuration is the basis of rational language. So you can think of figuration through art, right? For our end, art was very important for reshaping how you see the world. I mean, she was very, very involved in not only novels, but even poems. I mean, a lot of her examples are really about that. So yeah, that's the slightly longer <laughs> version, but absolutely. We're just about at time. Uh, if there's a student perhaps who has a question, we'll uh, take that. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It was really incredible to hear. Um, so I guess what I wanted to touch on, um, while not dwelling too much on power, I'm sorry, I don't, yeah, I don't know yeah, why yeah. that happened because um, it's supposed to be off, but anyway, yeah, sorry. But I, I think in echoing what a few others have said, it's certainly true that this dialogue does not happen in a void um, in terms of like purely aesthetics or things like that. 
So I suppose in reference to Rachel's presentation from earlier today, um, where she talked about how pro-life and pro-choice sides of the abortion debate found common ground of their, I guess, mutual value of life itself. They both kind of wanted the same end, just through vastly different means. How, would, how do you think that reflects on kind of not only our sense of, I guess, our role as global citizens, as people that share the same planet, but also in issues where it's harder to find that moral common ground, say, like the debate on the like the validity of the 2020 election, where it isn't as clear as abortion or even like the police um, what the moral stance of the sides are, and whether common ground can be found off that shared morality. Yeah, I guess I mean I don't think the abortion debate is clear, and um, and I don't think that the police debate is clear either. Although sometimes it can formulate in ways that make it seem as if it's clear, but then it comes almost back to you know the point about deep agreement. I mean it's just and it, I guess I don't know. I I'm a little resistant probably to translating this into moral terms when I'm talking about Arendt because I don't think of her really as a moral thinker. It's not that she doesn't think morality, we would call it more ethics, because she clearly is not talking about you know, Kantian morality, rule-based morality, or the old concept of morality. But that she's, um, you know, moral relations really are relations of, you know, I vow relations, et cetera. And she's really interested in this problem of how can we come to have a world in common? And this idea of the world as being the need, the thing that mediates us, right? That that's that's what we relate to. It's not so much to each other, right? It's more to this concept of the world. That's a very complex idea, I think, in Arendt's thought that I'm always struggling to really make sense of. And I see how I tend to get tripped up the moment I start to think in moral terms because. A lot of folks will say, it was particularly students in, in classes of mine will say, well, but isn't it morality? I mean, it's really, you know, it's a moral issue. I'm like, no, it's not. It's actually a political issue. And really trying to think about what is the difference between saying something's a political question versus saying it's a moral question. I think today, because of just the way critical political thinking has gone, there's a kind of smushing together, sorry, I don't even know if that's a verb, but of, you know, <laughs> morality and politics as if it's the same thing. And, and Arendt is always insisting it's not. So, yeah. <laughs> well, in a moment, I'm gonna ask you to um, join me again in thanking Linda, but before I do, uh, I wanna thank De Gruyter again for sponsoring this yeah. lecture. Um, and we have next year, uh, uh, another lecture to look forward to, um, the De Gruyter Arndt Lecture in Political Thinking. Um, on your way out, uh, we have a table with um, some merchandise. If you want to get a Pan Arndt Center mug or <laughs> <laughs> If you want to learn more about the center as well, uh, we have information on um, uh, becoming a member of the center as well as if you want to sign up for our free weekly newsletter if you're not already signed up. I'm Armundi. Uh, you can leave us your contact information. Uh, and tomorrow, just a reminder that uh, we'll be starting at 9 a.m. in Olin, room 102. Uh, we have a bunch of fantastic uh, speakers and papers, uh, so I hope to see many of you there. Have a good evening. And thank you.